President Bush is sleeping aboard Air Force One at Andrews Air Force Base tonight. In about two hours, he will leave for a first-of-a-kind drug summit in Colombia. He left the White House late tonight with aides insisting the arrangement is a matter of convenience, not security. The threat of an assassination attempt by cocaine cartel leaders has concerned officials for weeks. The summit location, as well as the streets in and around Cartagena, are literally crawling with soldiers. Every car is stopped and searched. Two U.S. ships are patrolling off the coast with 1,700 Marines on board, and that spurred noisy protests in Cartagena and Bogota. The other participants in the summit, Colombian President Barco, Bolivian President Zamora, and Peruvian President Garcia, arrived earlier today. President Bush and his high-profile drug czar William Bennett have been pushing law enforcement as a means of controlling drug trafficking. Meanwhile, Latin American governments have been pushing the United States for control of demand for the drug. The points of view are so far apart, many wonder how valuable this summit can really be. Channel 7's Lisa Stark is here now to give us perspective. Lisa? Anna, some are calling President Bush's trip grandstanding, but not according to a professor from Peru, an expert in Latin American studies. He says the Cartagena summit is important, at least symbolically. Important because it was instigated by the Latin American countries. And for once, he says, the U.S. is not calling all the shots. And for the first time, we are seeing the timing which the Latin American governments are beginning to have their own views, their own proposals, and to talk about it. That's why the Cartagena meeting is, is so important. All four countries who have the biggest stake in the drug war will be there. The coca is grown in Peru and Bolivia, processed in Colombia, purchased in the United States. A Colombian crackdown on traffickers seems to have had some success. This is the re first real uh, bloody blow that they've received. This, uh, this, this time they're actually hurt. But drug agents say shipments of cocaine to the U.S. have not diminished. Tomorrow's meeting won't change that anytime soon. But it marks the first summit to try to deal with cocaine trafficking. It was almost derailed by the U.S. invasion of Panama, which soured the presidents of Peru and Bolivia on meeting with the U.S. It has created a more uh, difficult climate to dialogue uh, and to reach agreements. There is a fear also that in the near future, there will be American troops sent to uh, Latin America because of the drug problem, too. The cocaine-producing countries don't want American troops. They want dollars. President Bush has pledged more than $2 billion over five years to pay for more police and encourage the planting of substitute crops. I think they will try to get some more economic aid because we believe that, that this is basically a U.S. problem, so the U.S. is the one that should provide the funds to fight this war on drugs. Now, President Bush wants to offer more than just money. He may suggest putting the U.S. Navy off the Colombian coast to track airplanes which might be loaded with drugs. The Latin American countries are not likely to agree to that. But all four countries are expected to sign some agreement to escalate the war on drugs. <laughs> presidential candidate, Senator Louis Galan, was shot down. He has declared his country under a state of siege, all because of his... There was action against the drug dealers today. The... A telephone caller claimed that the plane was blown up by drug dealers. Given the headlines, it's easy for Americans to think of Colombia as the main problem, a country that cannot control the violence or the flow of cocaine. But here in Colombia, there is a different perspective. We perceive the U.S. as being, as, uh, being the, the responsible for this uh, drug traffic. Uh, we say that if there was no demand, there would be no supply. Juan Manuel Santos, whose family newspaper El Tiempo is Colombia's most widely read newspaper, reflects the prevailing view here. The view that it is the cocaine users in the United States, who spend $60 billion annually on their habit, who keep the drug lords in business. And whenever Colombians can spotlight that use, as when the mayor of Washington, D.C., was charged with cocaine possession, they do so gleefully. Well, now, the day after Mayor Barry was busted, you put him on the front page here. Oh, yes. Why? Well, because this is a, it was tremendous news. Uh, this is a, a demonstration that the, the problem is not ours. The problem is uh, uh, mainly in the United States. Not only is it Americans who use the cocaine, Colombians further complain that it is American companies which help make the cocaine. To process the coca leaves in jungle laboratories requires a huge volume of chemicals, and those chemicals have been coming from the United States. Among them, kerosene, sulfuric acid, acetone, ether, 
and methyl ethyl ketone, MEK for short. Such compounds are used in legitimate enterprises in Colombia, but not in the quantity being imported into the country. Consider MEK, a popular solvent that the drug lords favor as a means for extracting the pure cocaine from coca paste. MEK is used by the petroleum industry in the manufacture of paints and varnishes and in making adhesives, all legitimate uses. But, says the head of the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration chemical section, Gene Hazlip, None of them, if you put them all together, could ever account for the quantity of that chemical that is being imported into Colombia from the United States and from Europe. It's far in excess, perhaps 40 percent, maybe 70 percent in excess of any legitimate need that we can identify. Of course, no U.S. chemical company sells directly to the drug lords. Exxon, for instance, which sells almost half the MEK shipped into Colombia, says it works hard to make certain there is no illegal diversion. But does it succeed? Exxon's John Rutledge, head of its Latin American division. We're quite confident, Sam, that the product that we export is not being diverted to illegal end uses. And if we thought that any of it was, if there was a suspicion of it, we'd cut sales of, the, of that product off to those customers immediately. And what does the DEA say? So if someone tells you that none is going to process cocaine? Well, I, I, I don't believe that. And in fact, it's impossible and uh, just, not, just cannot be the case. I think uh, if, if people think none of their product is, well, that's a different kind of statement, but even that's uh, very difficult to accept on the record. The DEA is now armed with a new law that allows it to check U.S. chemical sales right down to the final user and cut off suspected users. But the drug lords are still obtaining chemicals. If Colombians view the United States as being responsible for the illegal drug trade, they now also view the United States as increasingly responsible for putting a damper on Colombia's legal trade. Take coffee, the country's number one legal export. Last July, the U.S. and other consuming nations abandoned the World Coffee Trade Agreement for reasons of price fairness, they say. But the effect was to send Colombia's coffee price plummeting. Then there's cut flowers, Colombia's number three legal export after petroleum. Carnations mainly, which come through the Miami airport by the box load daily, where they are checked for hidden cocaine pouches. Last December, Washington announced an intent to slap on a stiff anti-dumping tariff, which would drastically reduce Colombian flour sales. These two actions, in coffee and flours, would cost Colombia $600 million annually. The effect that would have on the drug war could be disastrous, according to Colombia Cut Flour Association's Jorge Ribe. If you uh, limit the possibilities of people getting engaged into legitimate businesses, what do you expect from the unemployment rates coming up and what do you expect from people living out of if they have alternatives like the drug business? If we tell these people to grow coffee, to grow flowers, to grow soybean, and they don't have a market... Representative Charles Rangel, chairman of the U.S. House Narcotics Select Committee, says Colombia's economic complaints must be acted on. When you're dealing with an ally and a friend in a war, you don't retaliate the same way that you would with some other country. It's as simple as that. Finally, there is the touchy subject of how to deal with the drug lords themselves. How to deal with people like Pablo Escobar, the head of the Medellin drug cartel. Many Colombians disagree with their own government's cooperation with the U.S. push to extradite the drug lords to the United States for trial. 49% of the Colombian public favors negotiation with the drug lords. 59% favors amnesty for those who give themselves up. Among those who oppose extradition is the mayor of Medellin, Juan Gomez. Nos están matando por la extradición. We are being killed over extradition, says Gomez. It's a factor that causes violence. So let's bring them to trial in Colombia. And when you ask about Pablo Escobar in Medellin, you often get an ambivalent answer. What do you think of Pablo Escobar? Pablo Escobar? Well, he knows his job. He knows what he's doing. But, you know, I personally, I don't agree what this is doing, you know. To understand the ambivalence Medellin feels toward the drug lords, you have to come here, to Barrio Pablo. In 1983, Pablo Escobar built this low-rent housing project for the poor. Elsewhere, he built soccer stadiums. And often on opening day, he would show up and play with the youngsters. 
He subsidized schools and parks and gave to various charities. So while we may see Pablo Escobar as nothing but a narco murderer, to many people in Medellin, he is a local hero. It is against this background of internal division that Colombia's President Barco called today's summit, hoping at the very least to get this show of solidarity for his get tough policy if he came away with nothing else. And what you're looking at now is President Bush, who has just arrived a moment ago at Andrews Air Force Base outside Washington after a flight from Barranquilla in Colombia. His uh, Air Force jet having landed at Barranquilla and then helicoptering, of course, to uh, Cartagena, where the summit was held. The president, of course, proclaimed it a, the dawn of a new era, as we said before. Any word on what the Colombians thought? Well, yes, we do. You'll remember that we had Juan Manuel Santos, who was an editor of El Tiempo, Colombia's uh, largest newspaper, in the report we just showed. And this is what they're going to say, El Tiempo, tomorrow morning about this summit. Santos has written that it was semi-successful. Sounds like reporters everywhere. That it was important that there was no security incident, that the president, all of them, were safe and that the big component of that summit was public relations. <laughs> Again, any one of us could have written that. Yeah, but I'll tell you, watching your piece, I kept thinking back to something in our poll we took a few days ago that struck me as particularly poignant. The Colombians, sitting in the middle of the bombs and the execution and the constant threat, the majority of them thought they were winning the war on drugs. The majority of Americans, with the relative insulation we have up here, thought they were losing the war on drugs. That's why we wanted to show that different perspective. We go next tonight to a newsmaker interview with a key figure in the Colombia drug war. She is Monica de Grafe, Colombia's Minister of Justice, who is responsible for the operation of her country's besieged judicial system. During a recent visit to the United States, she asked for an extra $19 million in the United States to protect judges and court officials. Yesterday in Bogota, she talked with correspondent Charles Krauss. Specifically, when you were in Washington, you asked for $19, billion, $19 million worth of additional aid. Do you know yet whether or not that will be approved by the United States? I don't know if all the $19 million will be approved, but I know uh, we have $5 million already approved. They are coming now, some armored cars, uh, bulletproof vests. Uh, communication systems, uh, metal detectors, all this that I was asking for. Also I was asking for some in instruction for personal he uh, here in Colombia and there are do we're doing these programs right now. I don't know how much would this cost. I think it's around 10 million dollars that we are receiving in the next future. I don't know if the, the nine millions, um, but we're talking about them. Do you think judges in Colombia today are safe? Has enough yet been done to protect them? Uh, they will be safer, but I don't think they are in this moment completely safe. We are working in a program for them. They are much safer than two months ago, for example, that for sure. Uh, we have many judges to protect, so we, we must work very hard to protect uh, all, all of them. It's often been said that between corruption and intimidation, the judicial system in Colombia, at least insofar as drug-related cases, has really broken down. Do you think that's a fair evaluation of, of the system? Uh, no, I, uh, I've been um, very clear about that. I think, as in every part of the world, we have, uh, they have and we have uh, judges that they may be intimidated, uh, they are bought, uh, they could be bought by someone. But here they are working very good. Uh, we cannot say that uh, the most of them are in this case. Uh, one of the things they are killing the judges because they don't like the decision, they may, the decision that the judge could take. So I don't think that, that could be said. On the other hand, uh, you've uh, extradited, your government has extradited Eduardo Martinez and has promised to extradite other uh, persons, Colombians, who are wanted in the United States. Do you think the leaders of the Medellin cartel could, could be judged and convicted in this country, uh, given the situation now? Uh, I, I think we have uh, judges capable of doing that, yes. 
Now we have some special decrees, you know, the extradition and this, these others. But I, I really think the judicial system could handle that perfectly well. Uh, this is a special situation that we have uh, right now. I don't know how long would, would this take, but uh, yes, I can think the, they can judge them. To what extent does the Medellin cartel represent a threat, not only to the judicial system in Colombia, but to the whole political and governmental system in this country? I don't know uh, how much the Medellin cartel could, do, could be a threat. It is a threat right now. I think the violence, all the drug problem in Colombia has created, is a threat to our democracy, yes. Do you think that Colombians support the government when it says it is going or is fighting a war against the cartel? Yes, uh, many, we are honest people, we are peaceful people, and uh, I think we have a great support right now. The government is uh, working very hard, it's a very difficult moment, uh, I know, but we are doing all the best we can. Specifically though, in the area of the judiciary and providing protection for the judiciary, what do you need? from the United States that could help turn the situation around? I think the first uh, problem we had, we had with the judges was a lack of confidence in the government and in their own security. So the first thing I wanted to do, and that's why I went to the States and asked for, for your help, is to make them confident and to make them feel sure that they are not the only ones that are fighting and, they, and, they can't, and the government is working also for them. So I think that confidence is the first thing and how can you give them confidence is, uh, to protect them? How do you protect them? Well, that's what we are asking for and this is uh, armored cars, uh, some courses to self-defense, uh, to know what they do. Also, I think it's very important that we have uh, a judicial system that is much faster, much they can decide in a quicker way, and uh, we are working on that also, a reform of the judiciary system. Let me ask you, if I may, a couple of personal questions. There have been nine ministers of justice in Colombia over the last four years. One minister of justice has been killed. Many others have resigned because of threats to their life. Why did you take this job? I think we have to work for our country, first of all. I've been wor I was working with uh, the, the, this government. I, I believe in what this government is doing. I believe in our country and our people, and we have to help it. And if that's the way we c I was supposed to help, I decided I, I take the job. I was working as vice minister for, far mo for four months. I decided I could do something for the country. This moment is very difficult. It's very difficult and it's very different from, from the moment I accepted. But I'm working here and I want to, to work for, uh, as long as the president want, wants me to stay with him. Do you, you've been back uh, in Colombia now just a few days. Do you feel safe or do you feel threatened? I think in this moment uh, nobody can feel completely safe but yes I feel safe in a way and uh, well, I'm working with this is that what I have and I'm going to work with that in a way you've become a symbol in the United States for for the fight against the drug traffickers here in Colombia people really were quite impressed with your public appearances and and what you had to say in Washington but at the same time, I suppose you've become a symbol to the Medellin cartel uh, of the fight against them. Do you have any doubt at all that they would try and kill you if they could? Uh, I think uh, they can kill anyone, a symbol or not a symbol. I, I think if they want to kill, they can kill anyone. But I feel also that we are working in a very I'm working with a very specific problems 
uh, that we have in, in this ministry. So uh, if they see me as a threat, they, all, they threaten me already. So I don't know what's going to happen, but I think we all have to work. This is a country that has experienced a great deal of violence over the years, not just from the drug cartel, but from leftist guerrillas and now from right-wing paramilitary forces and before that from, from the political parties themselves that uh, fought each other for many, many years. Why is this country a country where violence seems to be so prevalent? Violence is hard here in Colombia and I think we're in a moment that everybody wants peace. And this is a special moment and I think President Barco has worked very, very hard on this. And that's why I think not only me, but all the people that want to live in a peaceful way, uh, that want to um, that have children and want them to grow up in a peaceful way have to have in this moment to work for that. It could be hard, it is hard to work in this moment, but we have to do it if we want a better a better place to live.